Howdy there folks and welcome into today's video. Got an interesting one here. I actually watched this live here today and I'm glad they put it on YouTube because I really wanted to react to this, okay? And essentially what this video gets into, it gets into a lot of different, uh, let's call it Wall Streeters opinions on not just what happened today with this massive drop, but kind of what's going on in the market right now and where this market's headed. And I wanna kind of share my perspective off of um, kind of what they're sharing out there as always. I appreciate everybody for joining me on today's video and uh, let me know if you guys are buying any stocks out there. I'd love to hear from you as always. Always. Also, thank you for everybody that subscribed to this now. Over 11,000 subscribers on the channel. It's growing pretty rapidly, okay? Hey, you know what? There's not many things going up, but the channel subscribers are going up, okay? So that's all the good news out there, I guess. Yeah, much love as always, guys. Appreciate you joining me. Let's get into it. Into this conversation, he's the chief investment officer at Bleakley Advisory Group. He's at the Future Proof Conference in California. Future Proof. Like a beautiful day, day there, Peter. Um, good Future to see you. What do you. What do you think of this print? What do you think this means for the Fed's path? I think if for anybody that didn't get to see, if, if you were hiding under a rock or something, essentially uh, inflation came in 0.1% over, essentially, well, actually technically 0.2% over what Wall Street was expecting. It was a 0.1% rise. Everybody was expecting a 0.1% down. So basically inflation is worse than people had expected on Wall Street. It's still going to do 75 next week. I mean, there's a, an interesting situation where the markets are really focused on the data that they see right now in terms of commodity prices. They see in, in some of the real-time rent figures that the rate of change is moderating. Uh, they're seeing used car prices slow down. But the BLS lags in how it captures that. So that's why we have sort of this, this two-lane highway with both sides going in opposite directions. And I think that's why we rallied 200 S&P points in the four days leading into today because the markets are driving on one side, and the BLS hasn't yet captured that. Unfortunately, the Fed is also lagging in, in how they are reacting to things. They're driving also in the, with the uh, rearview mirror uh, type mentality. But I think in overall where rates go from here, whether it's three and three quarters, four, four and a quarter, I think after next week's rate hike, uh, we're going to start playing a dangerous game with the state of the economy. The next rate hike... But before be we get into that, I want to make a point off of his point. He was just talking about the you know inflation numbers and everything is is lagging and a bunch of lagging indicators. I feel exactly like this. Now you can go into the actual data and you can kind of prove that these things are, are lagging indicators, especially when it comes to like things like rent and how they have to do these surveys and all those sorts of things. But just as like a gut feel. I've always felt like these things lag massively. For instance, I felt like we were having ridiculous rate of inflation at the beginning of 20, or excuse me, not at the beginning of 2020, late into 2020 and into the early parts of 2021. However, they would come out with these CPI numbers, these inflation numbers, and you know, it'd be like 4% up, 3% up, 5% up. And I was like, uh, based upon what I'm seeing in the real world and based upon everybody I know that runs businesses, they're seeing inflation way more than uh, you know what what the numbers are. However, recently over the past few months, I have not been seeing that level of increase of uh, let's just call it inflation or anything even close to it. But yet you get to see these numbers, and I'm like, how are we still in the eights? Because it just doesn't make any sense at this point. I feel like there's a whole massive lag in this whole situation, and the numbers lagged when things were going up, and now they're lagging, in my opinion, on the other way. When I do not see that level of inflation out there personally right now. Now, okay, the numbers say one thing, my feeling is another, and as this gentleman's bringing out, uh, all these indicators or, or a lot of the indicators, let's call it that, are lagging indicators. Whoa, only the second time in 40 years that the Fed funds rate is going to exceed the prior peak in a rate hiking cycle. So, again, we're only the second time in how many years did he say right there? Was it 40 years? Let's listen to this, this is important. It's going to exceed the prior oh. peak. Let me go back a little more rate hike is going to be only the second time in 40 years that the Fed funds rate is going to exceed the prior peak in a rate hiking wow. cycle. So again, we're playing now, we're getting into treacherous waters, I guess, with this aggressive Fed from here. True. BK, I'm curious, True. you know, based on what Peter said, if, if BK, you think that that's one of the reasons why the Fed should sort of wait. I mean, we don't know how this is going to impact the consumer. In terms of the wealth effect and the amount of wealth destroyed from the consumer perspective, it's not just the stock market, it's their, it's their home price as well. Um, their wages don't go as far because of in inflation. And we don't know how this is all going to pan out when it comes to the jobs market yet. True. 
Right. I think that's the big concern. And I think that's what the stock market's starting to price in. They're starting to say, you know, we have had, as Peter mentioned, this incredible amount of tightening, uh, not only just in rates, but the stock market, as you mentioned, housing going down. And housing's just starting to crack. We're just barely seeing the cracks in housing. So as that starts to come down, people... People are going to feel like they have less money than they did before, and that's going to, and then we don't know what that's going to do to the economy. So that's why I think, you know, and I'm more on the side of Peter here saying, listen, after this 75, it, this 75 might be even be a mistake. We know there's a lag, so, and we know that there's sticky inflation. So leave it here. Let's see what happens and be ready to start cutting rates if the economy really comes down. But first, the stock market has to decide that margins are going to come in and that earnings are going to be a lot lower than what people are forecasting right now. And we started to see... So first off there, I am in 100% agreement in regard to the thought process that essentially real estate's barely started to crack. Yes, I mean, I'm in full... I'm in full mode of thinking real estate's going to get worse for the minimum, and I'm talking minimum, the next six months. I think there's a real chance that real estate continues to get worse for the next 12 to 18 months. When you look at inventory skyrocketing right now, when you look at the 30-year skyrocketing now, what was today's 30-year average, 6.28 or something like that, right? And low confidence from consumers and people scared right now. Oh, gosh. I mean, you, you tack on all those things. How are you going to have a bullish real estate market? And prices are sky high. There's no way you know you can have a bullish real estate market in that. And so real estate's going to get worse for at least the next six months, but if not, the next 12 months, 18 months, in my personal opinion. And then we'll see kind of where things shake out from there. So, you know, and remember, real estate can fall for potentially, you know, many months and sometimes years after the stock market stopped falling. So you could actually start to see a recovery in the stock market, let's say, at the end of this year or into uh, 2023, while real estate continues to actually get worse. That's something we watched play out in 07 through 2011, right? Stock market bottomed in early 09. Real estate didn't bottom till late 2011. Think about that for a moment. I don't think this time's going to be that bad to that extent. But if things lag 6, 12, 18 months for real estate and it continues to get worse while the stock market is recovering, do not be surprised. Quarter earnings forecasts being trimmed by analysts, uh, Tim, at, at, at this point. Um, but I'm wondering what you think in terms of, you know, how, where we should be, because this is a group, and I'm just speaking broadly here, you know, on this panel today, who's always thought that the Fed should have gone sooner, should have gone harder. And now we're at this point where it sounds like a lot of you are a little bit worried about the impact because we haven't seen it all filter through yet. Look, that's fair. And we've talked to Fed credibility, lack thereof, over the, the last couple of years and maybe even for the last five to eight to ten years. But if you think about it, this is a Federal Reserve that could not raise interest rates 25 basis points uh, in, in 2018 and actually turned the market into a convulsion and ultimately they had to step back in. And this is one of the many things I, I loved when that they talked about here. You know, what this gentleman is talking about there with, uh, you know, 25, it, it, they tried to raise 25 basis points back in 2018 and the whole market flipped out and, it, you know, it basically went into a bear market uh, for a very short amount of time. But that's basically what happened. And uh, it, it's interesting because obviously you know the fed's gone insane compared to that and you know market certainly has dropped but it hasn't dropped quite to that extent in regards to the s p 500 and the dow the s p 500 and dow at the bottom in uh late 2018 was actually down more peak to trough than actually we're at right now in the market when it comes to the s p and the dow which is crazy to kind of think about begin the seizing process. And I think what we're talking about here is uh, a Fed that's done something unprecedented. Remember, this is a Fed that also after that July meeting where they, they pretty much indicated we just don't know what the impact of our rate hikes will be. That led to a lot of this Fed pivot dynamic that I think markets have started to press in. So absolutely fair. I mean, we went from a place where we could not raise rates even in good times, uh, let alone difficult times, let alone uh, an energy, a global energy uh, geopolitical crisis and, and, and a labor market that was nowhere near as strong back three or four years ago. I, I, I go back to say I think the labor markets are the biggest problem for the Fed uh, because, again, socially, it's a very big deal. It's very important for our country that the living minimum wage has changed in the last couple of years. Uh, that pressure is only going higher. Unionization pressure is only going higher. And again, you have a, a housing market that I think still looks bubblicious. But um, should they pause? Maybe. Like, I don't think 25 bips on the margin, whether it's 50, 75 or 100 uh, next week, is going to change the trajectory of an economy that still has not digested this. But the most important thing you just said is third quarter earnings, I don't think, have digested this. And they are the ultimate lagging indicator. 
Yeah, we're mm-hmm. only just seeing them come in right now. So, Peter, how do we start thinking about, how do you start thinking about equity valuations with this backdrop? Well, let's take the, the PE side. Uh, we've obviously re-rated. That's typically the, the first phase of, of a bear market is you take off the froth and trading at about 17 times earnings. Now that earnings, are we going to realize that earnings? And I think Tim brought up a good point about corporate profit margins and its high sensitivity to labor costs. I mean, you, over the last 50 years, you can draw a pretty tight relationship uh, with labor costs and the direction of profit margins. And with, at least on the services side, labor costs being uh, almost 70% of, of, of one's expense side. So if labor costs remain sticky, if they continue to rise, at the same time the revenue side starts to slow in the face of this slowing economy, you're going to have further cuts in earnings estimates at the same time. I don't think the PE multiple is bottomed out. I don't think this market just ends with the multiple 17 times. Now, where it bottoms out, I don't know, but I have to believe it's going to be 15 or lower, which is more of a, a longer-term average past just the last 20 years. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's interesting, you know, um, in terms of P's coming down. And, you know, in terms of large caps, you know, I like to take these piece by piece. And, you know, people that are core followers of me on, on the main channel, shout out to you guys. Um, you guys know I like to break this apart. And I'll look at like Yardini research and I'll pull apart essentially where large caps are trading at on like a forward P basis versus mid caps versus small. And what we've seen over the last six months, specifically six to nine months, is small caps and mid caps are trading incredibly cheap on any sort of a forward P metric, essentially, compared to anything we've had in the past 20 plus years, essentially. And so smalls and mids have already been devastated. And actually, I think there's a there's a great opportunity in those over the coming years, essentially. Large caps, however, when you break apart those S&P 500 large caps, what you're going to see is those are still trading, uh, I don't want to call it rich, but if you're looking at kind of mid-range, they're on the, the richer end of a mid-range. So call it slightly overvalued of kind of the mid-range now, okay? They've come down massively from where they're at back in November of 2021, which is a great thing. But you could still see some more damage in the large caps. That means some more damage in the Apples, the Microsofts, the Amazons, the uh, Google McDougals, all of those. You could see a little more damage in those, to be quite honest. They have a little more room to the downside if you're talking about getting to fair, what people would see as either trailing 12-month PEs or forward PEs, okay? And so this is just kind of some food for thought in regards to those. If those fell 5 to 10% as a whole, it's not the realm of possibility, and it would kind of make sense, right? And it would make those stocks much more of a fairer value. And but if you're talking about a 15 to 20% fall in those stocks, then you talk about them potentially getting to undervalued territory, which is quite interesting. And if you're wondering why some of the mids and smalls are having a lot of trouble going down anymore, one of the big reasons is those stocks are trading incredibly cheap compared to the market. They already got devastated. They were the first things to get shoved out of the market and put in the trash compactor. Meanwhile, stocks like Apple and Microsoft off some of the big dogs, right? They were doing okay. It's, it's a step-by-step process when you go through one of these bear markets, one of these big market falls. It usually takes anywhere from a year and a half to two and a half years to go through the cycle. And this cycle started in February of 2021, okay? I mean, I'm recording this video in, in uh, mid-September of 2022, <laughs> So we're well we're well over a year and a half into this whole game now at this point in time, and um, we're in, we're in the final stages essentially of this fall. And in the final stages, the biggest the big dogs get hit, and the safety stocks get hit. Okay, once those get hit real hard as well, then you know you're in a true what I call bottoming out process of the market, and then you actually have upside from there. So we're in the final stages of this game, and um, you know that's just kind of my view on that. Isn't that we're still we're still stuck at 17 basically because the E has come in a little bit. Um, Julie, how do you think about where we are in the markets and how much needs to come in? I love it when people say this stock is down 80 percent from its highs or this index is off 40 percent from its highs because maybe it should not never have been at that level. And so it's almost sort of, a, I don't know. It's a roost to yeah, think about it that that's way. that's exactly right. So it's important to look at where a company's, uh, you know, revenues going over the coming years based upon your research and where a company's net income's going in future years based upon your research. I think that's always the, the most important thing, you know. Um, yeah, highs and lows and all those sorts of things. You know, it's cool to hear, oh, wow, the stock's down 50% or whatever, um, or 20% or 60% or whatever, right? But at the end of the day, like, where's this net income going over the, the coming years? That's important. Like it's a correction. That's literally, it's, it's in the name. It's a correction 
we don't, it wasn't priced correctly in the first place. And I think if you look at valuations writ large for most of the economy, but tech in particular, they've got to points that just made absolutely no sense. And they were driven off of, you know, narrative rather than true fundamentals. But if you're looking at the broader economy and valuations right now, I think they continue to look pretty expensive. And I don't think we've nearly begun to do look at the that. re-rating. And the I mean, look at that. That, that shows you the power of today. You know, I called this a top 20 worst day I've ever seen in the market. Um, it was not a top 20 worst loss day for me personally, because some of my stocks actually held up really well in the market today, which, you know, kind of shows that some of those stocks have already bottomed out. But in terms of the market overall, you know, it's not a lot of days that I can remember the NASDAQ being down 5% plus. Today was one of those days, right? But I mean, look at the, 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 the pure numbers. I mean, $154 billion of market cap was lost. In Apple stock today. Over $100 billion of market cap was lost in Microsoft today. Almost $100 billion of, of Google McDougal was lost today. $86 billion of market cap was lost for Apple today. $43 billion of meta uh, market cap was lost today. Think about those numbers for a moment. Absolutely insane. All because the inflation number came in 0.2% essentially worse than what Wall Street was expecting. That, that's quite interesting, right? And when it goes back to, you know, what, what they are speaking about earlier in terms of like, oh, you know, this stock's down, you know, uh, 50%, 60%. I just always think it's important to think about these stocks in reg- re- relation to where their companies are going over time. So like a company like PayPal, for instance, down 51% is a massive number. I think that stock's really, really undervalued right now, okay? You look at a stock like Shopify, it's sold off, you know, 76%. I think Shopify is a great buy for the long term here based upon what I think their net income is going to in future years and their revenue is going to. However, there's a lot of other stocks in the stock market that are down 50, 60, 70, 80% and just, in my personal opinion, aren't going to ever come back or it's going to take a long, long time for them to ever get back to those sorts of numbers. And the reason being is their actual business is not going to, you know, let's just call it have that much growth in terms of their revenues and net income like other companies are. Evaluations of earnings estimates. They've come down a little, but they haven't really come down that much. And it's not just wages, right? It was supply chain makes everything more expensive. And then you get FX. And FX has a meaningful impact, not just in terms of, you know, constant currency checking, but it it, it makes our especially products more expensive abroad. So it, Especially it, for, for, uh, for companies that do business overseas. The FX, the, the foreign exchange problems are immense. It has an actual real world impact. And I think that that's not at all been factored into estimates, not nearly enough. And the FX problems then mainly affects the biggest of the big dog companies. That's something else to keep in mind. The Apples, the, the Microsofts, you know, the big global corporations that do business all over the world, it hurts them usually the worst. So that's just something to keep in mind there. I mean, some of the smallers in, in more mids, a lot of those companies only do business in the U.S., so it's not as big of a deal as, as you know, it is for, let's just call it other companies that sell products overseas. Anyway, yeah. Just quickly, Karen, um, we just scrolled through the losses in big cap technology. So Apple, Microsoft down about 5%. Meta down more than 9% in one session. How do you start mm-hmm. thinking about, especially the names that you own? Right, like Google down a lot. In integers, exactly. Yes, well, I love to say I like to start buying when things drop in integers, mm-hmm. which they're doing. Although if you're a hundred plus dollar stock, it's not the same. One integer isn't right. as good as a fifty dollar stock in an integer. But so, I'm not quite ready. That's that's where the VIX is kind of a trigger for me. When you get selling in integers and the VIX in the 30s, then as painful and, and as scary as it seems, then I want to buy. So too early right now. Yes, too early. BK, you're, you're nodding. Tim, you're nodding. Can we get a, a Saying full Saying too early. Wow. Okay. And she's talking about she likes to buy when the VIX is 30 plus. That's a that's kind of an old trader rule. And I'm not going to say it's wrong in, in any sort of, uh, you know, kind of context there. But it's just kind of like a usual thought process. When you see the VIX over 30, buy, buy, buy. That's, you know, what a lot of people kind of feel out there. And for VIX today, we're at 27. So we're not quite in the, the 30 ranges, right? So they're thinking kind of where we're at in kind of late June there. But but do keep in mind, you know, for instance, when did the market bottom? The market bottomed, I think, June 16th, if I recall. And yeah, right about then is right when the VIX topped, 33, 34, right there, right? So it is quite interesting to kind of keep in mind. And yeah, generally speaking, you buy when, you know, VIX is 30 plus, you know, usually you're going to do pretty well. Let's just call it that. It's here. Oh, Peter, too. Let's put us all up here. <laughs> Who thinks it's too early to start buying again in this market? Raise your hand, please. Too early? Raise your hand. Three. Three people, okay. 
I think you could could be tomorrow, though. I mean, it could could, could be tomorrow. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen tomorrow. All right, Peter, we're going to let you go. Enjoy that day. Yeah, my perspective is is never too early to buy. You know, this gets an old... This is where things get frustrating, okay? Because you are always told by the greatest investors in the world who have had the most success, do not try to time the market. And four people just raised their hand and said it's too early to buy right now, right? Which means they are timing the market. If they feel like you can't buy Meta today, like when can you buy it, right? So they're essentially timing the market. They're essentially doing what every one of the greatest investors ever told us not to do, right? And so it's just something to think about there, right? Something to consider as an investor in the market. Are you playing the timing game? And if you are, admit it. Admit it. I think that's the, the key, right? You got to be real with yourself. And if you are one of those people that feels like it's too, it's you can't buy today. You can't buy stocks that are down massively that you think have great upside potential over the next five years, right? If you feel like that, you are timing the market, and you just have to admit that you are essentially think you are smarter than every one of the greatest investors of all time, who basically tell you don't do that. If you feel like a company is very undervalued for the long term, you got to buy that company, right? in California. Great to have Thanks, you, Peter Bookfarb. Awesome. There's a couple stocks I bought today. I bought Meta stock today. I bought Palantir stock today, okay? I bought Meta $153. I bought Palantir, what was it, $7.47 or something like that. Those stocks could go down more. Palantir could go to six. Uh, Meta could go to 140, whatever, right? Cool, I'll buy more shares of those companies. I've always set my foundation up since 2008, 2009 when I got in the market. I always set my foundation up where I always have more income than expenses. Done that for 14 years now and it's all I do. And so I'm always in a position to buy. If you're gonna send a stock down to even a, a sillier valuation, fine, I'll buy more shares of it. I'm not gonna worry about like, oh, it might go down a few more percent and I could buy it perfect here. I'll just buy it again in a week or two. doesn't matter to me. Advisory growth. But if it came tomorrow, Tim, is there one name that you'd scoop up? Well, I was giving you my my Royals wave because I, I it's not as simple as saying would, would, is it too early to buy. I, I think there are companies like Google, uh, less so Meta, but like Apple, like like Amazon, that I think you can be building a position here. You absolutely should be building a position, and I think at some point we're going to see that these companies are going to be able to to hold these levels. But I don't think it is tomorrow. I, I, I guess to me it's a case where we really have to digest the 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 earnings quality that's coming up in the third quarter, and I'll continue to say what what. We've said many times, I haven't heard a demand warning out of any companies. Julie yeah. pointed out the issues with the dollar. I've heard dollar issues. I haven't heard about the rest of that. This doesn't feel like an environment in which enterprise BK will keep up spending uh, the same amounts of spending percentage wise, whatever it is, as years past. Right. And, and look at what the chip stocks did today. They got decimated. NVIDIA, you name it, they got decimated. So. See, you know, if you want to know when you're in the last innings of a, a ball game, let's call it that, and we are in the last innings, and the last innings could a- last a few months or something like that, but when you're in the last stage of a stock market crash, you're going to see what happened today. The big dogs got absolutely wrecked, right? But look at some of these small cap stocks. Honest was up today. Think about that for a moment. What? Honest was up today? The chef was up to, or not up today, but it was basically around break even today, Right? The planet was around break even. Elf did far better than the market here today, down only negative 2%, right? Think about that for a moment. So that, that just goes to show you that we're in the last innings of this crash. And like I said, the last innings can sometimes last a month. It can sometimes last a few months. But we are in the last innings of this game. Do not fool yourself. At the end of the day, the, the last ones to get hit are those big dogs and are the safety stocks and the banks and things like that. I think that's what's next. And not only that, you know, we do have a tight labor market. We're going to have some layoffs here, which basically means you need less computers for your people, right? I mean, it's pretty simple. So I don't think we've seen any of those effects yet. That's just starting. I mean, we haven't seen any layoffs. The, the unemployment rate is basically unchanged. So we're just starting to see it. A couple of the banks announced it today. But We've they- seen several layoffs in the, in the economy, we, especially back in the springtime into early summer. We saw a lot, of, a lot of layoffs from a lot of tech companies, for instance. I don't know what he's talking about there. Um, in terms of where we've seen a big uptick in employment, which has helped the unemployment rate, is things like travel and leisure right? Uh, Hospitality, those sorts of things. Restaurants, you know, those companies are still hiring coming off of Rona and still adding workers. But, you know, we've seen a lot of, I mean, 
like there's some great websites out there where you can track essentially how many of these companies have done big layoffs, and we've seen them. We've seen them. I haven't quite done it yet. Um, so you, you have a lot of factors here that it's just starting. That's why I was shaking my head and raising my hand. I don't even think, sure, in the short term, if you get a VIX at 30 and you get things just absolutely falling, that is a trading buy signal all day long. But I'm not sure that's the absolute bottom because I think we've got a couple other shoes to drop first on the economy and on earnings. Interesting. Yeah, I would love to hear your guys' opinion on anything discussed in that video here in this reaction. Thanks so much for everybody that subscribed to it. I appreciate you joining me. Over 11,000 strong now on the channel. Much love as always and have a great day.